Well, um, <clears throat> thank you, everyone. Couldn't have had a better way to lead into this session with the last question that um, Hari answered, so that I think that, was, uh, that set the tone. I think we all make a lot of mistakes, and uh, some of us learn from them, and some of, some of us don't. So I guess that's the key difference. Um, just, just some quick introductions. Um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur myself. I've made, just like Hari, I've made lots and lots of mistakes, and, um, but I do sleep well at night as well. Um, this is my second venture, and my first venture was when I was 23 years old. I did that for six years. I built an ERP product, and I exited in my late 20s with what I thought was a lot of money. Uh, it really wasn't. I had to get back into corporate. But one of the things that helped me tremendously throughout my corporate career of 15 years, and then in my entrepreneur venture, the second stint, is learning from all the mistakes that I made. And there were plenty of them, and we have focused on refining them, but we make mistakes every day, and we try and learn from them. But this is, this is not about me. This is really about the great set of people we've got here. It's a very diverse group. Um, I think a perfect set of people who can address different segments of um, the ecosystem. And um, so if I just start with Hamish, you know, Hamish is the chairman of um, REA, one of the largest real estate um, companies based out of Australia obviously doing some very, very interesting, fascinating stuff. Hamish has had a long career, leadership career across different um, you know, corporates such as New News Corp um, in the advertising industry as executive chairman for uh, Young and Rubicon, part of the WPP group. We've got Chen Chao here from, from Fave. Uh, we all know Fave as a successful startup. He's one of the co-founders, so I'm sure he's got lots of things to share with us. Um, we've got amongst us a very seasoned investor who, uh, from Mavcap, Sharil, who's obviously seen lots and lots of mistakes, and, but still carried on supporting those organizations, helping them learn, I guess, and mentoring those companies. You sit on a number of, you know, number of boards of those companies as well. Mavcap has done close to, what, 500, 500 investments since 2001, um, number of successful exits. And then here we've got Roger, um, you know, um, a fellow person from Singapore, and Roger is, um, the best way to describe Roger is he's a serial entrepreneur. He's the founder and CEO of Closet, which is an online branding uh, platform. And Roger's done a couple of successful exits. He's got, he's made lots of investments as well. He's been associated with a lot of startups. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a really nice diverse group of people. So if I start first with Sharil, I'll put you on the spot, you know, seeing that you know, you have um, seen mistakes, but yet you have charged on and kept faith in those companies and, and helped them learn. So it'd be great, great to get a perspective for all the entrepreneurs in the room, you know, how investors view that and, um, you know, what are some of the learnings that you've taken from that. Okay, thank you, Anil. Uh, okay, I think in MathCap, we have the luxury of seeing both entrepreneurs, GPs and LPs. So we, every, everyone got headaches but not as much as the entrepreneurs. Okay, I think uh, when we are investing, we are fairly uh, opportunistic people. If we are not opportunistic, uh, opportunistic we are won't be in, in the business anyway, because we are, I think, uh, investing into uh, uncharted territories. Uh, and then we are looking into uh, investing maybe with, the, with the company together with the founders, at least for three years minimum. So bad blood, uh, it's our pure business, nothing personal. I think among those who are the failures is most probably come from the individual themselves. Not about the technology, not about the products. They are, uh, they are, they are seen to, be, to know everything on the techie side, but there's lots of things that needs to be uh, managed by, by him. That is where institutional investors play a good role to get it successful. The reason being, as an investor, for us to be successful, I need you to be successful. You fail, I fail. This is as simple as that. I think bad bloods, as much as possible, we try to avoid it because we are there for a long term. Uh, that would be uh, my take on, on, on to, to just breaking the ice in terms of uh, bad bloods. Thanks. Well, thank you, Sharil. And um, look, we'll come back to you. I think we, we've left, we're not going to leave you that easy. You've got to answer some of the tough, tough calls. But I'm going to take it to Roger. Uh, being a serial entrepreneur, Roger, I'm pretty sure you're, um, you're going to be quite candid with some of the things you've seen. Um, it'd be great to get your perspective. Yeah, sure. Um, first, I, like, I don't like the word mistakes. I like to call them learning experiences. 
Uh, I've been involved with a number of startups, you know, many of them as a founder, co-founder. I've been an investor. And, you know, if you look at starting any business, right, you are entering into uncharted waters. So you don't know what you're doing, right? And that's where you have to learn. And uh, I remember Patrick earlier this morning, his keynote, right, as a company, you have to be constantly evolving and sometimes you have to pivot, right? So this is where... If you look at any startup, right, with your limited funding, you have to pick where to bet, right? Some bets are small, some bets are big, right? So example, you know, you're going to develop a product. What product do you want to de develop, right? I've, I've gone and looked at a regional expansion. Do I expand into Thailand or Indonesia? I've chosen Indonesia for Closet. We've done extremely well, uh, but it could have gone wrong, right? So I think this is where in many of those cases, if the best goes wrong, one of the important things is, what have you learned, right? And I think to Sheryl's point, your board or your investors shouldn't be caught by surprise. If they are, then they're not doing their job, right? Because you have to have a very good and transparent relationship with your investors. We are in the same boat. So whatever bet that you're making, they should be aware of that, right? It's just that when the bet doesn't go right, what have you learned? And what are you going to do next? I think the most important part is really about the recovery. So, you know, if that, if you have that transparency, right, between the founders, the management team, and the investors, you shouldn't have blood. That's just my take. Thank you. And um, Chen Chao, being um, the fave person on the stage, uh, we've got to come to you. You, you know, obviously, you're uh, you're disrupting the market in a number of different ways, and what you're doing. Uh, it'd be great to sort of get your perspective as a co-founder of what you've seen as you've been trying to scale up. Uh, what are the learnings um, from your experiences? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Amit. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, so for Faith, right, we are in a merchant service platform in the local businesses. So I think in this space, there are lots of giants, right? Most of the giants in the space are maybe 100 times, 1,000 times bigger than us. Bigger brand, bigger customers, bigger connections, whatever you call it, right? And being the small fish there, what we have is being the fast fish. I think a lot of it is focusing on, and the motto that we use internally is think big, start small, fail fast, scale faster. So I think a lot of it, we start from a big dream, right? I think the market for local business, local retail is huge. Malaysia alone is a few hundred billion. ASEAN is maybe a, bit, a trillion, right? And then start small. Everything starts from that. So I think for us, along the last three years, we went through a few journey. First, we went to acquire the Groupon subsidiaries. Because in the marketplace, it's a chicken and egg problem. Supply, demand. Connect the two, then we took what we want, we built on it, and then we knew that Groupon business bring new customers. We need to pivot to get it, not say pivot, extend it to get a retake, uh, repeat customers. That's where FaithPay as a loyalty service came in. We are not an e-wallet. Connect the two, and then from there, we build value-added services that connect through there. So I think being a smart startup, a lot of time, I, I, same thing, I, I won't call it mistakes. I think it's a learning, and then fail fast. What doesn't work, tweak it. And a lot of them, maybe a quote, Stripe founder, is maybe it's not called failure or mistakes, it's just we haven't succeeded yet. Just keep on trying. The day we fail is the day that we give up. Yeah, no, look, that's, that's a really interesting point, for, you know, in terms of failing fast. I think one of the things that, I, I was in a session a couple of months ago, and one of the things that, um, you know, caught my attention was the thing that really set Silicon Valley uh, apart is the fact that a lot of entrepreneurs are actually able to wear failure as a badge of honor, right? And I think that makes a huge difference because you can wear that as a badge of honor if you're learning from your experiences. And I think it's that ability uh, that drives that innovation ecosystem in that, uh, in that, particular, in that particular hub. So uh, we'll come back to that. But Hamish, I, I wanted to you know, pass this buck on to you because uh, you've been in large, very large global organizations and, and global leadership roles. Um, and you know, now you're with a very high growth company. It's interesting to have Property Guru and just before you, uh, before our panel here, um, and you know, the question that um, um, when, when Hari was asked the question around learnings from, from, from the mistakes that they might have made, and his focus was on the people in the management team, I'd love to get your perspective on that. I, I love what Hari said. I mean, he, he referenced the fact that um, a lot of the mistakes that he's made have been around people, and I, I would concur with that 100%. I mean, I, I tend to think, uh, a lot of the investments that we've made in companies, it's when I've misread the people and their vision. I think chemistry between 
the entrepreneur and the company, excepting that's where I spend most of my time making investments with uh, smaller companies that can add value to our business. So I think what he said was absolutely correct in every way. I think the other thing that I would say is that um, if you're an entrepreneur, you really have to think about where you want to be in three and five years' time. And, and my over overriding sort of uh, recommendation would be to really think about the quality of the company that you keep. And what I mean by that is money's important. The, the, the money that you get back into your business is obviously critical, but it's almost secondary. And I think you've got to think about who are the companies that you're going to do business? How can they take you from one stage to another? How can they add value to your business? Um, are they strategic? Are they people who are going to not be there just for the journey, but really add value to your business? And I think that's critical. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to shift track a little bit, and I'd probably uh, want you guys to chime in on this particular point. You know, we've talked about you know issues around scaling up and investments and people and the teams and stuff. But one of the things that you know I find really interesting, and it's probably the nature of the beast with with startups, uh, often led by you know, very smart individuals um, with a very smart technology mindset. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that people forget that at the end of the day, you're still running a business. And you're not excused whether it's a startup or a large corporation. You still have obligations. You have obligations to your um, employees. You have obligations, uh, first and foremost, to your customers as well, to your investors, and, um, you know, obviously, from a regulatory standpoint, to the government, right? Let's not forget them. And... Um, you know, from my experience and all the discussions that I have with a lot of entrepreneurs, I find that there isn't enough emphasis put on those sort of compliance requirements. And um, I'd love to get your perspective, Sharil, on, on that because you're obviously, you're a government-led fund, but you're also, you, you also drive that ecosystem. Um, so we'd love to get your perspective. Okay, uh, governance. Uh, we must know that when we invest, we have to exit. And if you, have a guide, if you are talking about IPO route, governance is number one. For, from all regulators. So as uh, investors, we must make sure that the management are doing their stuff right from day one that we are investing in. That's number one. Number two, most often than not, they are raising more than one time. So the following investors, potential investors, would need to be looking at governance as well. So we are telling the company, if you don't buck up, if you don't really, you're not ready to be in, uh, in the marketplace, please do it now. The reason being, the next investor won't be looking at your company if you are already messed up. So I think the role of, especially on the government side, apart from giving them the money to, to start the business, we are hoping that they will be successful and giving back to the government in form of tax. Sorry guys, tax is tax, you, won't, you cannot run away from that. But then again, in order for you to do that, you need to be profitable. So in order to do that, this is basically what the VC is there to do, to, to nurture the companies and then to curate exit that everyone is happy. And for us, we have another KPI that says that even though you already exited from the company, you will need to still monitor them for the next two years. Because we don't want a situation whereby when we exited from these companies, then they fail. So this is actually what the government does to all these uh, companies, especially uh, local companies. Thanks. No, thank you. And um, Hamish, just um, on, on that similar sort of subject, I mean, you've, you know, you're um, looking at you know, the market that you're originally from, and you know, if you look at the Australian market, um, are there any comparisons that you see in terms of how startups operate there and, and how startups are operating here and some of the key learnings? Uh, Look, there's, there's great energy with the startup culture in Australia, but it's no different to here. Lots of inspiring, great people that, you know, I've, I've met, you know, here today. And um, I used to live up in Hong Kong. I've travelled to Malaysia and Singapore and Southeast Asia for years. So there's no difference in terms of the calibre of people. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting because a great idea can come from any part of the world. So look at what Afterpay has done in Australia in the last couple of years. They've created enormous wealth for their shareholders. But, but I just want to refer it back to your, your last sort of question. I think a lot of entrepreneurs sell a bit of their company and they don't quite understand that when you sell a bit of your company, you sell a bit of your soul. And the, the, the world does change when that happens. And, and I think um, entrepreneurs have to expect and, and understand that 
things are going to change when you've got new shareholders that they have different expectations in terms of what they want from your business. So I think the original question around alignment, keeping good company and making sure that you have a shared vision is really important for entrepreneurs. Yeah, and, and so, you know, as you're, as you're building up your business, you know, I empathise with everyone from my own experience, you've got so many things going on. You're trying to build a product, you're trying to hire people, you're, you're trying to be compliant, you're trying first and foremost to, to create a market and look after your customers and, um, you know, everyone talks about customer obsession and, and that's very important. But I think it's people obsession, you've got to be obsessed with all the people that you have around you. Um, how do you think, I mean, what are some of the things that entrepreneurs can um, can learn and where can they actually, wh what's the sort of uh, company they can keep to externally to kind of get those learnings because you're better off learning from other people's experiences than your own because um, you want to avoid making those mistakes. Look, look, I'm sure the other panellists here have, have a point of view. What I've seen often is that the entrepreneur is so obsessed by their idea and their concept they find it hard to let go. And there's an old saying I learnt many years ago when, when I was living in New York, that you've got to let go to grow. In many ways, you've got to empower people to run the business and trust them. And that's an expertise that's learned on the job quite often. Um, and, you know, you've got to accept that if, if you're going to get a business with scale, you have to have a team that is brought along for the vision uh, and for the whole journey, and they understand where you want to go as the leader. And I think that's really critical. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And um, so, Roger, you know, you've you made an exit um, about ten years ago, a very successful exit to a very large fund, um, and then yet you kept on the journey and you kept building new companies or investing in them and, and or being co-founder. Um, did you did you at any point feel that you were playing the role as a mentor by by taking all the learnings that you had um, in some of these organisations? And how how have entrepreneurs in these various ventures that you've been involved in, how have they responded to that, um, that sort of coaching or mentoring that you might be offering? I'm always asked that, you know, Roger, why, what drives you, right? I say, it's my wife. She drives me out of the house. <laughs> uh, seriously, you know, if you look at um, my various, I have two other startups, right? So I'm, uh, I'm the CEO executive uh, founder at Closet, I have two other startups, and where I'm imparting, so my, my thing is there are many ways, right, to reach your destination. It's never a straight path. So different people have different ways of getting there. So even for me, I've been there, I've done that, but I think every CEO, right, my co-founder, you know, he is driving the company, we have to be supportive. I think like Hemi said, you guide, but you, you shouldn't be hands off overly, right? But you should give him enough freedom, right? To make his own journey. So this is a fine balance between where I guess, you know, the gray hair counts, right? You have seen certain things, uh, this is going to be risky bad, right? So I think you mitigate the risk, but ultimately you have to let them run the business. Uh, but to your point, I think one of the things that I'm very uh, anal about is governance, right? Because I've done so many due diligence. There's nothing that you can hide, right? This guy's bringing top guns, right? So Whatever you do from day one, right? A, a lot of startups will say, it's okay, I'm startup, but you know, I'm going to do that in, you know, when I'm doing fundraising. No, from day one, right? Make sure that you get your governance in place, uh, especially in this business, in the digital business. One of the big areas that you have to be careful about is data protection, right? If you're doing business with Europe, you have GDPR, you have compliance. If you're not, you know, the, the minute you're not, you're out of the game, right? So I think this is where investors are very, very uh, mindful uh, of investing in companies that complies with regulations, right? So I think this is where, you know, you have to find the balance between letting them have the freedom, right? Your co-founders, but at the same time, guiding them to make sure that the best practices are in place. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's a great point you brought up with, um, with, with the data, data privacy issue. And I think that's, that's, that was actually my, my initial thought process when I talked about that particular point around compliance. Um, you know, I, I can speak as a, as a fellow entrepreneur that as an investee company, one of the first principles that we put in place was we made sure that we had a, we, we, we channelized some of our funding, not a lot of it, but some of it, we parked it towards making sure we had the right legal framework. So we work with one of the best law firms we work with, um, and that gives you a lot of leverage as you negotiate with various parties when you have a big law firm behind you. Um, working with making sure that we had one of the top audit firms because investors like to see 
that your statements, your financials are kosher, makes, it, makes those conversations a lot easier. And making sure that when we pick partners like um, our PR agency as well, working with one of the big global ones, because that's where they can actually help, scale, help you scale up. So there's a lot of learnings you get from that. I know this is flashing up. Is there any one last statement anyone wants to make from the panel here? So I think for all the entrepreneurs out there, I think go out there and make the value. I think a lot of it, the way I look at it, what we're doing is how do we make it easier, cheaper, better, faster for the target audience, right? So whether we're serving merchant, consumer in whichever sector, if we bring value, we are relevant. If we don't bring value, we're not relevant. I think for us, our customer is actually the merchant, the restaurants. The restaurants, the retailers will decide whether faith is relevant or faith is irrelevant. Every day we wake up, how do we help them to make more money, save costs, bring more efficiency? I think that's, maybe in whatever business you do, think about that. Easier, cheaper, better, faster. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. And um, thanks, thanks, everyone, for uh, giving us the opportunity. A big high five for, uh, for this outstanding panel.